Now it comes time for me to introduce our last panelist, uh, Dr. Peter Rossett. I know a lot about Peter, <laughs> but I, I won't say most of it. Um, Peter, is a, <clears throat> Peter is a global, uh, global alternative associate at CENSA, which is Center for the Study of the Americas, Center for the Study of Rural Change in Mexico, co-coordinator of the Land Research Action Network, a visiting research scientist at the University of Michigan, and a faculty member at Ecosur, and he's a bunk, he does other things too. Uh, his, uh, his PhD thesis, if he doesn't remember, uh, his PhD thesis was on tomato bean intercropping. Um, he tries to deny the fact that he's an actually a natural scientist posing as a social scientist. And the big secret about Peter is, and he probably doesn't want me to tell this, but he actually knows a lot about insects. Okay? So, Peter? Most of I forgot. Okay. I restarted. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here uh, once again in Ann Arbor after being here many years ago. Um, I'm going to choose agroecology as one of the key elements in the food sovereignty struggle. And I want to say that um, I definitely see food sovereignty as a strategy or a banner of struggle I, that I believe it was created by social movements in order to build an alliance of like-minded sectors and movements in order to transform the global food system in rural areas and therefore sometimes we hold it up to a standard it wasn't intended to meet which is a, a, a policy instrument or some kind of, a, of an academic definition. In any event, I'm going to talk about agroecology and di Dialogo de Saberes or dialogues amongst different kinds of knowledge which uh, Maria Elena Martinez and I argue is one of the fundamental processes that goes on in social movements in general and in Via Campesina in particular and uh, gives it a lot of its strength. Now, why agroecology? I love this quote from, one of a, from a South Korean peasant delegate to the Via, La Via Campesina Global Agroecology uh, encounter in Thailand where she said that food sovereignty without agroecology is a hollow discourse, but agroecology without food sovereignty is a mere technicism. So that what that says is that for Via Campesina, uh, agroecology gains its importance, its, its reason, because it's part of the way to build true food sovereignty. So uh, the, the points that I'm going to make is that uh, it's a strategy of struggle, and therefore it's constantly evolving based on that Dialogo de Saberes or dialogue in diversity amongst the very diverse, and a number of speakers have mentioned this, the very diverse movements that make up La Via Campesina. There's both agroecology above, um, in other words, in the, in the institutions where there's a lot of agroecology used as framing discourse for the public debate uh, over the immaterial territories of public policy and uh, decisions that affect people's lives from above. And there's also agroecology below, or agroecology as farming, as opposed to agroecology as framing, which means the real on-the-ground work of building and networking peasant agroecology schools, for example, or developing campesino de campesino, or farmer to farmer, uh, agroecology territory, territorial-based processes as a way to build food sovereignty. And I want to focus on a couple of on three processes that are taking place right now. There's a process in agroecology above at the FAO, the Food and, Ag and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, which Phil talked about somewhat. There's a, res there's a res partially responsive and partially going along with its own agenda process among social movements with a major meeting on agroecology that just took place in Nilani, Mali earlier this year. And then there's a definitely agroecology below internal process on its own agenda inside Via Campesina to, uh, amongst all of the peasant agroecology schools which are mushrooming around the world amongst the Via Campesina member organizations. So first, very briefly, to define Dialogo de Saberes, which is what's the, the, the process behind all of the Via Campesina stuff, is that it's a collective construction of emergent meaning based on dialogue between people who have different historically specific experiences, different cosmovisions, and different ways of knowing. 
particularly this dialogue takes place when they're faced with new collective challenges in a, in a changing world. So how do uh, peasants in Africa and family farmers in Saskatchewan dialogue when they're suddenly both faced with land grabbing in very different circumstances and they bring different knowledge to the table and what comes out of that dialogue are new and emergent ideas. So such a dialogue is based on exchange amongst difference and on collective reflection often leading to emergent recontextualization and resignification of knowledges and meanings related to histories, traditions, territories, experiences, processes, and actions, but which often, and especially in Via Campesina, form the basis for new collective action of resistance and construction of new processes. So if we think about a, a, a different kind of dialogue, like a stakeholder process, what that means is uh, peasants would sit down with the World Bank and come up with a midpoint situation, with a midpoint solution. So like instead of killing all of us, just kill half of us, for example, which is why Via Campesina refuses to engage in stakeholder processes. <laughs> On the other hand, the Dialogo de Saberes amongst equals who are different doesn't come up with a midpoint solution but tends and Via Campesina really shows this come up with a new solution an emerging solution even though it's based on old knowledge and traditional knowledge and different cosmovisions when they're put together something new and that's how food sovereignty arose through the Dialogo de Saberes inside La Via Campesina faced with the challenges of neoliberal and free trade policy. So uh, right now we're in, a, we're in a particular moment in history, which is a new moment for agroecology, uh, which I mark by two events, one that took place in September of last year and one that took place in February of, th of this year. One was at the Food and Agriculture Organization, which its, its own director general called the Cathedral of the Green Revolution, for the first time formally recognized agroecology and held the first international conference or symposium on agroecology at FAO in Rome last September to which Via Campesina and other social movements basically forced our way in, but as you'll see, didn't necessarily get the final word. And that was followed in February by Via Campesina and all of the organizations in what Phil talked about, the IPC, the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty, called a social movement international forum on agroecology, partially in response to the FAO, but re in reality in response to the internal agenda. And the internal agenda really evolves on, along its own dynamic, which is if we see a periodization of food sovereignty in the beginning, as we mentioned yesterday, maybe it was more responsive to the WTO and free trade policy, but as it has evolved, it's become more about constructing the alternatives, and therefore agroecology has, has rapidly risen in importance due to that internal dynamic, and it was time to have an international forum. Via Campesina had its own internal international forum in 2011 in Thailand, but it was time to have an international forum with the peer movements from other sectors like pastor, nomadic pastoralists, fisher folk, indigenous people, even urban uh, movements, et cetera. And so that's what took place in Mali. But it's kind of like the two extremes of a, agenda setting for agroecology above and agenda setting for agroecology below. In both cases, agroecology surging to a new level of importance never seen before, especially crazy. In, in the FAO circumstance where we know that institutionality has long ridiculed or ignored people toiling uh, on agroecology and now suddenly ha agroecology has been discovered by institutionality ranging from the, from the FAO to universities to the World Bank to private companies to governments. So if we look at the, the short-term agenda right now, the agendas above and the agendas below are what, are what Subcomandante Marcos calls los calendarios de arriba y los calendarios de geografías de abajo. We have uh, the FAO International Symposium last, last uh, September. This year we had the Forum of Agroecology in Mali, which is a true Dialogo de Saberes. Uh, I'm leaving tomorrow for Milan, where the, meeting, the, the Mali Steering Committee from the Nilani meeting and IPC are going to manage or plan civil society presence because FAO is going to follow up on its conference in Rome with, with regional continental agroecology symposia which are going to take place in Brazil for all of Latin America later in June, in Asia, in, in Bangkok in October for all of Asia, and in Senegal in November for all of Africa. 
in which there's a very different agenda for agroecology being pushed through that FAO process. And I'm going to get to that in a moment. And therefore, civil society beyond just the peasant farmer sector of Via Campesina, but including all these other sectors, needs to have a planned response to that because what happens in those institutional spaces gets translated into public policies which have a dramatic impact on people. So that's following a little bit having to deal with the agenda from, our, from above. And Via Campesina has to be in both spaces. We'd love to ignore the agenda from above, as maybe the Zapatistas have the luxury of doing, but Via Campesina has to be both in the, in, the, in the agenda above, but also have its own agenda of constructing alternatives below. And that comes up just shortly afterwards in June, where there's going to be a, an internal Via Campesina meeting in Spain, in which all of these different peasant agroecology schools, agroecology from below, are going to be networked to each, with each other at a global level in order to exchange horizontally and strengthen each other and not have peasant organization schools have to depend on NGOs or nonprofits or academics or, or funding agencies or government officials in different countries, but learn and share with each other. And I should point out that, that this explosion of agroecology in Via Campesina has led to the creation of maybe 70 or maybe more peasant <coughs> agroecology schools run by peasant organizations in the Americas, Asia, Africa, and Europe. Uh, after that comes the first one of the FAO regional conferences, still just in June. That's going to be in Brasilia. And then, still just in June, the CLOC, which is the Latin America part of Via Campesina, is going to have the first meeting of all peasant agroecology schools in Latin America, which is going to take place at one of Via Campesina's agroecology schools, the Latin American Peasant Agroecology School in Paraná, Brazil. So there's a packed agenda. Agroecology is exploding. And, and, and I'd like to say that this is the moment for agroecology where its future is going to be decided. Do we lose it completely like we lost terms like sustainable development, which became completely meaningless, or do we draw the line and defend it? It's now or it's never. And that's the interpretation that Via Campesina has. And Via Campesina gives a high level of importance to it precisely because of its link to building food sovereignty. In this institutionality discovery of agroecology, their clear intention is to put forth a narrowly technical vision. Basically, what's going on is that the industrial model of agriculture is coming against some of its, up against some of its own sustainability limits. Soil erosion, loss of soil fertility, pests being resistant to pesticides, being blamed for climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, uh, having to use water where no water is available, etc. And so uh, the future of industrial agriculture is in danger. And therefore, power, with a capital P, has to make some adjustments, has to do some fine tuning in order to allow the dominant model to keep dominating. And in that, they suddenly discovered agroecology as a source of potentially additional tools in the toolbox of industrial agriculture in order to make it slightly more sustainable so it continue, can continue to displace peasants and produce unhealthy and expensive food for the rest of us. So because of this institutional discovery, agroecology has become a territory in dispute. And here I love the, the analysis of the Brazilian critical geographers like Bernardo Manzano Fernandes, who talk about real material territories like land. When they're disputed, there's a, there's a simultaneous dispute that takes place in the immaterial ideas of discourse and ideas, where the World Bank, for example, develops a language of efficiency, feeding the world uh, to justify, for example, land, the need for land grabbing, and then Via Campesina and social movements develop a language of the benefits of peasant agriculture, healthy and local food, to justify fighting off the land grabbing and defending peasant territory. So the dispute always takes place real on the ground with police and tear gas and bullets and picket lines, but it also takes place at the level of discourse. And agroecology now suddenly is, is in both levels of that dispute. And there's even a dispute within the FAO process. The, the decision to hold an agroecology conference in FAO was pushed by the government of France, which has an idea that they call agro-ecology. And I want to beg all of you never to call it agro-ecology, because what they mean by that is the narrowly technical vision, vision without any of the political and social baggage which they feel just complicates it. But France, France, the Minister of Agriculture of France has declared France to be the first Ministry of Agriculture in the world to have only agro-ecology policies, which means they're going to continue to do everything they're already doing but make it a little bit more sustainable. And Brazil, those two, go those two governments pushed FAO to recognize agroecology. 
the FAO responded by scheduling the conference and then received a private visit from the United States and several other unnamed countries, possibly maybe Phil's homeland, uh, in which it was explained to the Director General that you couldn't have a major conference without having the executive committee of the FAO or the powerful donor countries vote on it. And at what point had that vote taken place because the United States was unaware of that and said that the meeting had to be canceled because you can't talk about agroecology in the Cathedral of the Green Revolution. The Director General uh, was concerned about the money coming from France and not losing that, and so he held on to the idea of having it and negotiated with the United States. And the United States said, okay, you can do it, but instead of three days, it can only be two days, because the third day they were gonna talk about policy. The first two days were just gonna be talking about science. And the FAO was prohibited from allowing the phrases trade policy, GMOs, or food sovereignty from appearing in any published document of the conference. And I received a call about my talk from a subdirector of FAO in Rome begging me that, and understanding how hard this was for Via Campesina, but begging me to be understanding and please to take the phrase food sovereignty out of my abstract so that they wouldn't have the whole conference canceled because of my abstract. So at the same time, the FAO was under pressure from the social movements, the civil society mechanism that Phil described, which is the vehicle by which Vies Campesina and others try to have influence on FAO, and SOCLA, a, a very important ally of the social movements, which is the Latin American Scientific Society for, Latin, for, for, for Agroecology. We managed to fight for and win some spaces in the program. Here are some photos of the FAO conference, and just keep these in mind so you can compare them to the photos from Mali that are coming up soon. But these are Via Campesina speakers who actually got to speak. And we were invited to and did a poster for the poster session about all of our agroecology schools that Via Campesina has, peasant agroecology schools. Just keep that in mind because we'll come back to it. And these are some of, of the other Via Campesina delegates. Uh, the man over there, um, Chavan Jean-Baptiste, was just, uh, just launched his campaign to become the next president of Haiti on the new Workers and Peasants Party in Haiti, and he's been a global leader of Via Campesina, so let's hope that he has a chance there to become the, the Evo Morales of Haiti. Uh, in any event, we had a lot of participation, a lot of speakers, we had a poster session, but in the final report we got two sentences and somehow our poster was left out of all of the posters that are up on the FAO website. Um, and so basically the, 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 all the participation by social movements was squeezed out of the report. I assume that they were afraid the U.S. would cancel the rest of the process. And his closing remarks, Jose Graziano da Silva, Director General of FAO, said, today a window was opened in what for 50 years has been the Cathedral of the Green Revolution. But then he also went on to say, this is great and we need all the approaches like agroecology and GMOs together. <laughs> so, and this is the main agroecology policy of FAO, save and grow a policymaker's guide to the sustainable intensification of smallholder crop production which is really like a fake agroecology where you use a few things to reduce soil erosion while you buy lots of GMOs. So what was made clear, like abundantly clear as a result of the FAO policy uh, conference was that agroecology today is, excuse my terrible English, agroecology today is divided into two camps. On the institutional side, there's Agri World Bank, FAO, et cetera. Agroecology is another set of technologies in the toolbox of, uh, toolbox of industrial agriculture. In other words, to be used to conform and not challenge structures of power. They call it agro-ecology, climate smart agriculture, sustainable intensification, et cetera. On the civil society side, instead of seeing agroecology as a toolbox for industrial agriculture, we see it as the alternative to agroecology for, trans for challenging and transforming structures of power, uh, the exact opposite, and for building food sovereignty. And so if you strip, if you strip out the, the political and social and cultural dimensions and just leave the mere technicism, then you get the World Bank version. So what's coming down the road? The Continental Symposiums of FAO. We have ministries of agriculture between September and now scurrying to create agroecology programs and policies. Uh, we've had organizations in Via Campesina around the world be called up by the ministries of agriculture <laughs> saying, oh my God, we have to create an agroecology program, but we don't know what it is. Um, 
unfortunately, they, they're also asking Monsanto and others like that. And Monsanto, for example, is responding by buying all of the companies that sell commercial compost in India because they see agroecology as, an, as the next big business opportunity. And that's what we call neoliberal commercial agroecology. So it's a moment of both opportunity and threat. It's an opportunity because all of a sudden, after agroecology has been ignored by institutionality, there are going to be public policies, there's going to be credit, there's going to be funding, there's going to be research money. All of that's going to come flowing down. And can we get any of that to actually benefit poor people or peasants is the question. Are we mobilized enough to force that? On the other hand, we're under the threat of the final co-optation of agroecology. So here's the International Agroecology. Forum in Milani. This was a Dialogo de Saberes following the example of the 2007 Agroecology uh, Swood Sovereignty Forum. These are ideas, they come from the peasant sector, but at a certain point the peasant sector broadens it out because we need a broader alliance. As several people said here, peasants can't do it alone. We need to build allies, uh, even with urban people, uh, even with uh, fisher folk, even with pastoralists. And so just like in 2007, that was a turning point for food sovereignty. As Annette said, I feel we're going to say five years from now that 2015 was a turning point for agroecology, and I urge people to read the declaration from the forum in Mali, which I think really gives a strong and unified voice uh, to agroecology. It was interesting how this was a social movement forum, but a whole bunch of FAO staff appeared at it, um, not particularly invited, but they just showed up. Lots of Dialogo de Saberes, lots of incredible diversity of social movements from around the world, uh, a virtual peasant United Nations. We were translating, into, I believe, into 12 or 13 different languages simultaneously. Those of you who've been in Via Campesina movements know what that's like. Uh, amazing uh, peasants, fisher folk, uh, urban, urban movements, consumer movements, indigenous people, uh, Latin America, Asia, Africa, Europe, North America. And you know, we came to consensus, and that consensus is going to form the basis for the civil society response and presence in the FAO regional forums, but also uh, in terms of fueling the building agroecology from below. So the declaration of the International Forum, you can find that online. Uh, as I said, it was a real dialogo de saberes, bringing a common understanding of agroecology amongst people's movements, not a common understanding with institutionality. And, uh, then we have agroecology below, which is the process, for example, of the peasant agroecology schools, which are physical places for Dialogo de Saberes in an organized fashion to take place. That means peasants teaching peasants, farmers teaching farmers about how to do agroecology, about how to repl replicate the successes of agroecology. And I'll close with this uh, image from one of our peasant agroecology schools in La Via Campesina. This is the first graduating class with their slogan that they cho chose for their graduation, which was Estudio, Lucha y Organización con la Agroecología en la Revolución. Gracias. Thank you. how you would see, how, how would you see that in, in the context of this conference, let's say, in terms of we have diverse groups of people right here, and within the time frame that we have them together, what's, what is the question that you would pose to us in, in order to really tap into that collective intelligence? Well, I, I think we're in a Dialogo de Saberes here, and, and, I, and the, the idea of Dialogo de Saberes is if we put ourselves in equal footing, as, as Jahi was saying very eloquently at the end of his talk, then we can have a real dialogue. If we don't privilege academic knowledge over people's knowledge or, or urban knowledge over rural knowledge, but we all, we all give it an equal footing, uh, then we have the basis for, for, for discussion, and I think I really feel like it's happening here in a very positive way. And academics are just one more sector to sit down with and share knowledge with. Academics are very good, as, as somebody said, I think it was Jahi, at some particular kinds of knowledge, and other people are very good at, at other kinds of knowledge, and we need as much of that knowledge as possible in dialogue for these
these new emergent ideas to, come, to, to, to arise. And we have a major crisis, civilatory, civil, civilatory, how do you say that in English? <laughs> Civilizational crisis in, in the world today. And we, we radically need new ideas. Old ideas aren't, aren't, aren't going to get us very far. So it is this kind of dialogue that's necessary. But I, I remember something that took place in, in our first global agroecology conference of Via Campesina in Latin America, which was in Venezuela in 2009, where we had a confrontation within the Dialogo de Saberes between indigenous com cosmovision and, and, and European origin Marxist-Leninism uh, and, and historical materialism over, over agroecology. And I remember of, uh, one of the, our indigenous peasant leaders from Guatemala responding to a Brazilian uh, uh, workers' movement uh, discussion about the importance of historical materialism saying, uh, we indigenous people could probably learn a lot from, histor from, from historical materialism. It's a very interesting cosmovision, and it can explain a lot of things. But you could also learn a lot from indigenous cosmovision. So we could have a very productive Dialogo de Saberes, but only if you can accept that historical materialism is a cosmovision. It's one more cosmovision. If you can accept being horizontal with us, then we, can, then we can both learn from each other. And actually, and so he said, I propose that Guatemala have the next Via Campesina Agroecology Conference in, in two years, and I propose that the whole conference be organized around the theme of dialogue between indigenous com cosmovision and historical materialism. And it actually was the case. And, and, and while at the beginning it really seemed that one totally denied the validity of the other, uh, it, was in, it was, in fact, possible uh, to, 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 to come up with visions of, of peasant-based agroecology and social movements that, that respected both of those cosmovisions. And so I hope that we can do the same here with the academic cosmovision and the, and the, the grassroots activist cosmovision, which I see in a very good dialogue here. Catherine? Uh, here, uh, I, I wonder if you would say a little bit more about the um, appropriation of agroecology and I'm thinking of two things in particular. The word can be appropriated in the sense of that look how green now these, uh, the green revolution is becoming. But what, on the other hand, one of the arguments for agroecology in the, in the food sovereignty context is that there are aspects of agroecological processes that are very hard to commodify. And so I'm wondering if in a more fundamental way that <coughs> actually does not have to be very difficult. I think some of them are hard to commodify, but unfortunately, they're going to be used as tools to to to, to maintain long, to lengthen the what is it called the the product life of some of the things that that can be commodified. So, for example, not paying attention to agroecology shortens the pro useful product life of a pesticide. Paying attention to a little bit of agroecology can can make it profitable for more years. So it's being, a, I think it'll be at least appropriate in that way, but also the idea that I think there's two fundamental different views in agroecology. One is that it should be based on input substitution, and what we see is these government programs around the world, uh, India organic, Chiapas organic, Indonesia organic, what they do is they induce peasants to produce for niche export markets and give credits to businessmen and entrepreneurs to create companies that will sell organic farming inputs like commercial compost and, and biopesticides. This is why Monsanto is buying all the commercial compost companies, for example, because they see if a wave of public policy to fund and give credit to organic farming and agroecology comes down the line, then those are going to be the next new profitable markets to get into. And unfortunately, this, this rush to public policy now for agroecology in the ministries of agriculture around the world, unless we're really strong, it's all going to be that kind of of, of commodifying, either commodifying the, the input substitution version of agroecology or, or, or it's going to be the prolonging their, their products kind of agroecology. And, and the, the zero budget natural farming movement in India says that commercial organic farming is just as big an enemy of peasants as, the, as multinational corporations and Monsanto because they say 600,000 peasants have committed suicide in India because we got into debts for paying for the chemical products, the chemical fertilizer and the commercial seeds, and now they want us to buy even more expensive organic inputs that are going to be sold by the same companies. So how, how is that going to help the debt crisis 
of Indian peasants. No, we want something that's based on our own, on our own resources, zero budget. We're not going to get any, uh, any more bank loans to buy any more products. Everything's going to be done with local resources, and they're finding that they can produce even more without buying those products. So that's kind of the which way is agroecology going to go, and it's now uh, pretty much that it's going to be decided because public policy is coming into it. Uh, what is the relationship between uh, La Via Campesina and Slow Food Terra Madre Network and how can Slow Food um, better uh, support this movement? should probably let Hilda <laughs> answer that, but, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think that, that there's like a friendship going on, but they definitely represent very different sectors. I feel, I feel like the Slow Food comes out of the whole the whole, the whole chef and, 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 and nice eating movement. But on the other hand, they've been very respectful of the peasant movement and tried to be supportive from that space. And every time they hold the Terra Madre conference, they always give like 30 plane tickets for BF Campesina people to go and exchange with each other and, and go to the meeting. So, you know, I, I would say there's kind, some kind of a very, they're very, very loose allies, but not really exactly in the same orbit, except part of the food movement in some very loose sense. <coughs> yes. Um, you show photos and experiences of great meetings by these small farmers all over the world and we are here in this great meeting as well. I wonder how we can put this together. I, I miss your representation of the here, yeah, like local communities and local farmers. We are talking about them, we are discussing how can we put them together in a normal way. Yeah, well, I mean, I feel like the good thing in this conference is we have lots of, of, of local farmers from the urban farming sector and, and the urban food system sector. And I think that's a really important dialogue. And, and just how rich that's been here has made me think that's really a sector that has to be more present in the Via Campesina space. On the other hand, there, there does seem to be a lack of, of more of the rural uh, movements and rural farmers in this, in this particular meeting. So maybe we can make a mark of something to improve the next time on that. But definitely it's a step forward in terms of the, the urban agriculture and urban food system activism, social movement presence in this dialogue. All the farmers are out working. So yeah. Towards the end, you mentioned, I think you said that agroecology is an alternative. Um, and so I'm curious as to what implications that Really good question, and that turned out to be the, the absolute biggest debate that took place in the, in the Mali conference, because uh, Via Campesina process, until meeting all these other sectors, was we can't just call it agroecology. We have to differentiate ourselves from corporate agroecology or commercial agroecology, so we want to call it peasant agroecology. So all the Via Campesina delegates went to Mali saying, we want to call the declaration the peasant agroecology declaration. The first response from all the other sectors were, wait a minute, we're fisher folk, we're not peasants, or we're urban people, we're not peasants. So we can't go along with that. So then the Via Campesina people, we went off and huddled and said, OK, people's agroecology. <laughs> and so came back and said, people's agroecology. Let's call it people's agroecology. And so a lot of the other sectors said, yes, that's great. That's what we really need. But then the Latin American agroecology movement, which is not Via Campesina, which is an allied movement, Maela, said, no way. If we put an adjective on it, then we're already ceding the, f the loss of the first battle to defend agroecology by by legitimizing the other agroecologies as also being agroecology. So we oppose any adjective. We're gonna, we want the, the conference and the movement to defend agroecology as a way of life, as a way of being, as a way of thinking, um, as agroecology. And we want the fight to be to say all that other shit like climate smart agriculture, that's not agroecology. And so we actually had a 50-50 split. Uh, no, 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 n neither side swayed the other. And then in Dialogo de Saberes, uh, when, 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 there's, when there's no clear consensus, you sort of table things and let them simmer in the background for a couple of years and then come back to it. So for now, it w we just left it as agroecology without the 
adjective, but I know there's a lot of people agitating for, for people's agroecology or agroecología popular to go along with reforma agraria popular and other things like that. So we'll see. I don't know how that debate's going to come out, but a lot of people think what you think, and a lot of people think the other thing. So we'll see. <laughs> Further questions? Does somebody else have a hand up here, I thought? No further questions? Okay, well, thank, thank you, Peter. You.